It's been such a pleasure leading worship with everybody here and with all of you guys. Um, it's such a privilege. So I just want, if you are comfortable with it, I would like to invite you to come forward actually so we can all worship the Lord together as one body. I do ask that you be careful of the wires. Don't trip, please. <laughs> um, but you all signed a liability waiver, so nice. you can't sue. <laughs> so if you are comfortable, I say get up, get out of your seat, come up front. Let's make this a little more personal with the Lord. Don't be shy, nobody bites here. You can come on up. <laughs> okay. We're gonna start worship by prayer. So I asked for some respect for prayer time. So let's just start with that, yeah? <laughs> okay. okay. So dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for an, the honor and the privilege to be here, God. I thank you so much for letting us be among our friends, God, people we're comfortable with, and you being in the room, Father. I thank you so much for the ability to know you and to say your name and to lift it up during worship. I thank you so much for, again, the privilege it is to be here and to listen to these amazing people tell us more about you and how real you are and how true you are, Father. I thank you so much for everybody in this room, for getting them here safely, and for them being here on time. <laughs> I thank you, Father, for all your good gifts and all that you've given us, God, the breath in our lungs right now, God, the voices that we use to sing to you. I thank you so much for just life and for our time tonight. So I pray that you lead tonight's worship, it's all about you. I pray we sing to you, God. There is an audience of one and it's to you alone. So Father, I pray that you take it out of all our hands and you put it into yours and that you hear our praise and that it is a sweet aroma to you. In your name I pray. Breaking through 
When all was lost, he crossed eternity. The king of life was on the move. For in a dark, cold tomb, where our Lord was laid, what miraculous breath, and we're forever changed. All hell.
are open, that there's no intimidation when coming into the subject, Father. I ask that you give us peace to ask questions that we're scared to, God. The courage to ask them, Father. I mean, we know we're in a room not to be judged, but to learn about you, God. We're not here to judge, we're here to defend our faith. So, Father, I ask that you give us the courage to ask the questions to defend our faith. All right, this next song, y'all, I want you to do something, okay? It says you are worthy of it all. And I know we all have some burdens on our back, and in this retreat, we're trying to get away from all of them. So I want you to raise your hands up <laughs> as an act of surrender. Either raise it, put it here, wherever, to the side, however you do it. <laughs> But I want you to get in a position of surrendering it all to God because it should not be here, it should be there. So when we say you are worthy of it all, we mean it. You are worthy of it all. You said to cast my anxieties upon you, so I am casting them. I put them at your feet. I put them where, nowhere near me because they are not mine. You asked for them, here you go. Who am I to hold them? They're in no better hands than in his. So when we say you are worthy of it all, you are worthy of me listening to you, 
when you say cast your burdens on me he is worthy of it and he's good so in this next song i want you to actually mean it he is worthy of us being here he is worthy of us giving him praise and honor and glory present and a time that we got to thank you and honor you. Father, I pray that this posture continues as, as the weekend goes on and as the days go on. I pray that we come to you, God, with hearts yearning to know you, who you are, your character, your history, all the little details about your life, just like you know all the little details of ours. So God, I pray that you 
speak through the speaker and maybe he be a willing vessel God to just be used by you in your name I pray Hi guys, good, good to see you again. Tonight we have a short and sweet talk about science and faith, science and religion, okay? It's not gonna be too difficult. This is actually my specialty, so I've done a, a, a master's, I finished a master's in the philosophy of science and religion in the University of Edinburgh, and uh, it's a huge, topic like think about religions of the world and sciences and the intersection between those two big arenas it's a huge 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 field of study and we're going to distill it into one nice small capsule you'll be ready to face the world amen all right let's go um i'm gonna start with a quotation by an atheist scientist who is very popular and he, uh, like he, he popularizes difficult scientific uh, ideas, um, but he's a staunch atheist, okay? He, he has a lot of you know, very aggressive debates and aggressive books against uh, religion per se, but Christianity in specific. His name is Lawrence Krauss. He's a cosmologist, a cosmologist, is someone who's is like an expert in cosmetics and you know makeup and no no he's, he's an expert in cosmology the beginnings of the universe how the universe began and he says this he says the doctrines of religion are outdated and that's for good reason they were created by bronze age or iron age peasants who didn't even know that the earth orbited the sun so a bronze, the Bronze Age is somewhere between 2000 and 1000 BC, and then the Iron Age is starting from 1000 BC uh, upwards. Um, so the wisdom in those books, like the holy books of religion, is not wisdom at all. So he, he's basically saying that, you know, because these people did not understand the reality of the universe, uh, all of their wisdom, or all of their collective wisdom is not really wisdom. They... they they, they didn't even know something as basic as that the sun is in the center of the solar uh, system and that the earth uh, orbit, orbited it. Most scientists don't spend enough time thinking about God to even know if they are atheists. He's saying basically that the default uh, state of a scientist is atheism and they're completely uninterested in the God question because they try and understand how the world works and God never enter, enters into it. Um, it's just completely irrelevant. And in fact, the more we learned about the natural world, the more we've learned that you don't need any divine intervention to explain um, anything. So he is quite clear. He has a very staunch uh, stance against God. And... I'm going to summarize his quote in two sentences. Most scientists are not interested in the God question. And number two, science renders God unnecessary. Basically, the more we understand the world using science, the less we need God to explain anything. And I'm going to take these two claims in, a, like, in sequence. I'm, I'm going to tell you why I think he's absolutely, absolutely wrong. Okay? Tamam? All right, let's pray for a minute and then go on with our lecture. Father, we come um, to you with curious minds, yet uh, uh, weary bo bodies and uh, maybe not enough energy. Um, may you give us strength and focus, but also help us um, somehow meet you in this very scientific topic. You are the Lord of science. You have created this world and you can meet us anywhere in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So why is Lawrence Krauss wrong? Let's take the first claim. Um, uh, most scientists are not interested in God. Most scientists are by default atheists. Well, from a historical standpoint, he is wrong because 
all the famous scientists, like the fathers of science, the founders of the scientific revolution that happened in Europe a few centuries ago, all of them, without exception, are strong Christians. So Newton, Galileo, Kepler, Copernicus, Boyle, Faraday, just like as a sample, they were all Christians. But you know, whenever someone says that, the response comes from someone like Lawrence Krauss says, so what? Everyone was a Christian then, you know? It's not impressive that all these guys are Christians. Everyone was a Christian. It's not a, at all impressive. But wait, we are not saying that these guys are just Christians by coincidence. I'm actually saying something that is much deeper. I want to say that these guys were scientists uh, because they were Christians. Um, let me rephrase that. Their Christian convictions set a strong foundation for the practice of their science. Listen to uh, Kepler. Okay, so Kepler, uh, if you studied some uh, science, like in school, he's the guy who really helped us understand how uh, the Earth and other planets orbit around the, the sun. It's not like in a perfect circle. It's like in an elliptical uh, pathway. And Kepler was the first guy to discover this and explain it very well. He was a mathematical genius. He actually thought numbers had uh, like a mystical, spiritual significance that they are somehow in a way alive. And he thought of numbers as the language of God. It was so interesting the way he looked at numbers. And he says this. The chief aim of all investigations of the external world should be to discover the rational order and harmony which has been imposed on it by God and which he revealed to us in the language of mathematics. Let me read this uh, quote once again. The chief aim of all investigations, of all scientific endeavors, is not just... Um, Curiosity is not, uh, it's not just, you know, to help us understand the world. No, he has a very, very spiritual aim to his science. The chief aim of all investigations of the external world should be to discover the rational order on, and harmony which has been imposed on it by God and which he revealed to us in the language of mathematics. You know, it was, it's very interesting. At the time of Kepler, there was this... Um, um, trend in, uh, between scientists that God has written two books, not just one book, not, not just the Bible. He, they called it the book of scripture and the book of nature. And they all thought that since both the book of scripture and the book of nature have the same author, they will always be in harmony. Even if some difficulties or some discrepancies seem to arise, these discrepancies basically are a matter of our ignorance. But the more we understand, the more we investigate, we realize that, wow, these um, two books go hand in hand. They are amazingly you know, intertwined and complementary to our understanding of the world. The very reason we do science is to understand God's mind, not all of it for sure, but his strategy, his uh, order, his uh, mystery in creating the world. And we understand that through the language of mathematics. It's like a divine language. So you see here that this guy was studying the planets, not just because he had a mathematical inclination, not because he was just a, like a big fat nerd. He loved mathematics. He looked at the planets. He studied them as a form of worship. And his Christian convictions um, motivated and governed his science and his scientific methodology. Not only Kepler, but also Newton. Newton, you probably know, Newton gravity, you know, the apple, you know, you know, the whole, you know the whole story. He says this, the most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. This being governs all things, not as the soul of the world, but as the Lord, as Lord overall, I'm going to explain this in a, in, in a second. And on account of his, of his dominion, he is to be called Lord God. 
And this Greek word, uh, Greek word is called panto, pantocrator, panto, pantocrator, uh, like a dictator, no, not a dictator, but like a, a pantocrator. So a pantocrator is the Lord or the ruler of all things. Panto means all. So let me just explain a little bit of context. Newton is trying to critique uh, uh, you know, previous science, science that was based on Greek uh, mythology. Greek mythology, like from the days of Aristotle and Plato, you know, these uh, Greek philosophers, um, these guys thought that the elements of the universe, like uh, trees, uh, rocks, rivers, water, had souls of their own. They almost like had minds of their own. They actually thought something that is very weird. They thought that matter was eternal. You know what, what eternal is? Uh, ha something that has no beginning. When they thought of creation, they thought of uh, God as, they called him the prime mover. So think of God like as a carpenter. A carpenter makes a chair or makes a table, but he doesn't make the wood. He gets the wood, okay, and he shapes the wood. He moves the wood around to make a table. But the wood is a given. So these early philosophers, when they thought of the universe, they thought of the universe uh, as something like this. Matter plus God. Matter plus God. And, and both of them come like in a, um, together in a package. As Christians, we reject that because we think that God created matter out of nothing. The, the Latin word for this is ex nihilo. There was nothing alongside with God. God was not obliged to use matter because it was somewhat, somehow there next to him. God created matter. Matter does not have a soul or a spirit in its own it's the creation of God, and God is the Lord over everything. So Newton, as a Christian scientist, he had some weird ideas, but generally his theology was Christian, thought that, you know what, the, the, the best way we could understand what we are discovering about the universe is that this universe, the elements of the universe, are not um, uh, animate uh, beings like these elements are not they, have, they don't have minds and souls of their own no they are things that are created by God and God imposed a system for these things to work with so this was like a very small sample of very early scientists they call them like the fathers of the scientific movement or the scientific revolution that these guys were Christians not just by coincidence but their science was colored with Christian convictions and assumptions and ideas. And they used these ideas to critique previous science and base their science on the idea that God created the world from nothing and he created it with a system, with an order that we could discover. But then you, you might say, well, these were the early scientists, but modern scientists are mostly, a, are mostly atheists, right? Wrong. Actually, up till now, if you study, like, for example, uh, the history of the Nobel Prize, um, the overwhelming majority of scientists who won the prize, even in the very hard science, sciences like chemistry, uh, physics, all of them not all of them, but a big percentage of them are believers in some way or another. I know the media always wants to portray to us this uh, image that, you know, all intelligent scientists are atheists, you know. Uh, only only, uh, only second-tier scientists are Christians or Muslims or things like that. But the real scientists are atheists. Well, you know what? There is such a thing as popular myths. You know uh, what's a popular myth? Like, they are myths, but they're just popular because they're propagated through the media. But if you basically take a survey of scientists, a big chunk, probably even the majority of them, would believe in a god uh, of some sort or some kind. So 
Lawrence Krauss, on a historical, but also on a statistical um, investigation, he's, he's wrong. But, but let, me, let me just uh, push that idea a little bit more. Why are these scientists uh, friendly to faith? Is it a coincidence? Or are there ideas in the Christian faith that are actually conducive and supportive of science? Yes, there are many, and I could go on and on and on, but I'll just take two ideas that are very Christian ideas, but also they helped, historically, they have had the rise of science. The first idea is that the world, the universe, is law-governed. You've all studied in science. I know some people might hate science, but you know it's, it's a fact of life. You just need to accept it. That there's such a thing as laws of nature, like these are mathematical equations that describe the regularities that occur every day in the, out, in the workings of the universe. And these mathematical equations are so stable, they're so robust, they're so regular, that scientists now regard them as laws. You know, um, in, in, in scientific endeavors, things start out as a hypothesis, like a, some kind of a suggestion. You know, I think that such and such moves in such and such a way. So a hypothesis is tested rigor rigorously. You know, you get scientific experiments, you get surveys, you get things like that. And if a hypothesis proves to be strong, it is elevated, it's promoted into a theory. Okay, so a theory is a very strong scientific idea that has passed, uh, that has passed a lot of tests and rigorous investigation. But what about really, really, really good theories that have you know, proven time and time again that they are correct, that they're strong? Now these are promoted into laws, okay? And the idea that we have a handful of laws that seem to govern the world is such a, an interesting idea. Where do these laws come from? Why are these laws there in the first place? If you think about laws um, from a judicial perspective, you know, judges make laws, courts make laws. These Laws seem to come from intelligent minds. And in a way, Christians from the very beginning have always thought about the world as being created and governed by an intelligent God that has instated laws that act as mediators for him to run the world. He, God is like an intelligent watchmaker that sets up the watch and then he winds it up, or winds it up, yeah, I think, yeah, that's the right word, word, and then leaves it to outwork with a preset set of laws. So this idea is very, very Christian. Um, if you remove God out of the equation, okay, you, f you will find it a little bit difficult to assume the presence of laws. And that's actually what a lot of good uh, or clever atheist philosophers do. They want to say there's no such thing as laws. Laws are just, you know, our descriptions of what happens regularly. But as Christians, we want to say, yes, we can expect that the world is governed by laws because we believe in an intelligent law maker. Now, there's a second idea here. There could be laws, but who says we are able to know them or discover them? That's, a, that's a, even another difficult fact. The idea that we as humans could investigate, to, we, we could conduct scientific investigations and experiments and actually discover the laws, that's even a more interesting fact. But why are we able to do, uh, why are we able to do such a thing? You know. Let's assume that there is a God, that he created this world using laws. What says that we are, are actually able to discover these laws, like the language of mathematics, like Kepler was saying? But that's another interesting idea. If humans are created in the image of God, they are able to understand God's language. So not only are 
uh, there are laws to govern the world, but we as humans ha somehow have the capacity to discover these laws and express them in mathematical equations. Now, these two ideas that there, there are laws and we have the ability to discover the laws are very, very strongly associated ideas with Christianity, that there is an intelligent creator and he created us in his image. That's why the Christian thinker C.S. Lewis, he summarized it such a, in such a way. He says, men became scientific. I'm sorry for all the women here. He, he, he you know, he, he means men and women, but he's just like a, a Victorian writer from the 20th century. He just said men. Men became scientific because they expected law in nature. And they expected law in nature because they believed in a law giver. So he's trying to say that the rise of science in Europe in the 15th, 16th, and 17th century was not by coincidence. It was motivated by a prior strong conviction that there is a lawmaker. And because there is a lawmaker, we should expect law in the universe. And that prompted Christians in Europe to try and discover these laws. Um, let me add a little bit of information here. There was one sociologist that, that uh, tried to um, compare the rise of science in Europe uh, to the rise of technology in ancient China, okay? And it's so interesting. He, he discovered that um, China, uh, Chinese intellectuals, were not interested in pure sciences. They were not interested in chemistry. They were not interested in mathematics. They were not interested in physics. Why? They were only interested in technological advancements, like, like making things, making um, uh, small machines and, and things like that. And he says this, Buddhism is a very atheistic religion. It's, it doesn't pose uh, an intelligent God who is distinct from the world who created it. No, it's like we're part of the universe and the universe is just there. And because they don't have the idea of an intelligent lawmaker, they found no interest or inkling to look for natural laws. And he says that um, the idea of finding natural laws in pure sciences was only present in the Christian and the Muslim world, but not in the Chinese world. But the Muslim world and the Christian world have this in common. They believe in an intelligent, distinct creator from the universe. Now, there's an interesting fact here, or there's an interesting, uh, not fact, but an interesting idea here. What makes us able to understand the universe? You know, if you think about it, we are such, we're so small in comparison to the universe. Have you seen like the videos that, you know, show how small Earth is in comparison like to the solar system and the galaxy and the whole universe? And we are like from a historical standpoint, we're like a blip on the screen, like the whole human history. And it's so interesting that our very small minds are somehow able to come up with mathematical equations that represent what happens here in the universe. And you need to ask, how does this happen? How does what happens in our small minds correspond to what happens in the large universe? Philosophers of science call that the surprising success of science. Why are we able to do science in the first place? It is such a surprise that we are actually be able to discover the universe because there is no necessary connection between what goes on in the universe and what goes on into our brains. In fact, if you assume an atheistic worldview, our brains are just um, um, a series of chemical reactions and electrical impulses that have no purpose and have no mind behind it. Why should we even trust this um, process with any ideas that it tells us? And that's why philosophers of science have always wondered why are we able to discover anything about the universe in any meaningful way? You know, um, Einstein, he, he says this, the most 
incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. Of course, he, he doesn't mean that it is absolutely or completely comprehensible, but he was just so in awe of the fact that we are actually able to comprehend how the universe works. And for him, that fact was so incomprehensible. How are we able to really discover anything meaningful about the universe? As a Christian, I have an easy answer for this surprising uh, phenomena. We are created in the image of God. We are able to understand the universe because the God, the intelligent God who has created the universe has created us and has given us a part of his mind, like a, um, let me say, like a miniature of his mind. And we can understand him a little bit, enough to understand how the universe runs and we develop in that. So uh, just to finalize the first um, uh, claim by Lawrence Krauss that uh, most Christians are atheists. Uh, sorry, no, <laughs> most scientists, sorry. I, that's the jet lag speaking, I'm sorry. Uh, um, most atheists, uh, most scientists are atheists. No, absolutely not. Christianity is not in conflict with science. In fact, Christian thought was foundational to the rise of science. And let me give you one quotation from a very famous historian of science, a, a, science who, a, a historian that specializes in studying how science developed across the centuries. His name is Peter Harrison, he's Australian. And he says this, for several decades now, um, historians of science have been, have been painstakingly chipping away at the conflict thesis. What's the conflict th thesis? It's the popular idea that says that science and religion are somehow in conflict. That you need to be either a scientist or a, a religious person. And he's saying, you know what? We as historians of science, we're trying to chip away at this very famous but stupid idea. As, um, and he, he says that it is known, uh, like it's a, it's, it's a known thing in our trade. It's a conflict thesis. And the result of their labors, uh, there here refers to the, uh, to the historians of science. The result of their labors is a far more complex and nuanced picture of science-religion relations. An important part of this story is the positive role played by religion in the rise of science. In various ways, religious considerations. By the way, he, he's actually very specifically says Christianity because this is where like the most scientific advancement has been uh, done. In various ways, religious considerations provided the motivation to pursue science, provided its core philosophical presuppositions, informed its methods and content, and led and lent it social legitimacy. Actually, if you go back in history, the biggest sponsor of science in its early days was the Catholic Church. Um, sometimes, a lot of times, it is actually portrayed to us that the Catholic Church was very resistant to science, that scientists were like liberators of the mind from the dark ages, but that is all popular myth. Most scientists, all scientists in the beginning were Christians, and most of them were clergy and priests, and even the ones who weren't, even Galileo, famous Galileo, was sponsored by the church. And by the way, Galileo was not burnt at the stake for saying that the earth revolved around the earth, uh, the earth <laughs> revolved around the sun, okay? He was just a big mouth with a very unwise diplomatic uh, uh, person, undiplomatic personality, and he got in trouble because he, um, you know, he got into trouble with people in power. So it was a political thing; it was not a scientific conflict. All right. So wrong. A lot of scientists are believers, historically, but also in in a modern sense. Now, the second thing that Lawrence Krauss has said, that science somehow renders God unnecessary. Remember how he said it? He said, the more we understand 
science, the more we understand how the, work, how the world works through science, the less we need God to explain anything about the world. And let me try to unpack this a little bit. What is he saying? How, what is the objection he is presenting to religion? His um, objection it goes like this. In the beginning, or like, like in the early ages, our knowledge of the world was very, very primitive. Right? Makes sense, you know? Uh, science evolves with time, or progresses with time. And our knowledge of the world was like uh, this broken line. It's very random, it's very sporadic, it's very unconnected. And we, have a, we had a lot of gaps in our knowledge. That's how he describes it. Like in the Bronze Age, we had a lot of gaps in our knowledge. We do not really understand how lightning works or how uh, tides work or how the stars revolved or moved. We had a lot of gaps. And he says that the ancients basically filled these gaps with, with God. I don't understand it, therefore God did it. And that's why you, you see the ancients um, uh, like positing a god of thunder, a god of the sea, a god of the Nile, a god. And he's trying to just explain that these people did not understand how the world works, so they attributed the natural phenomena they, they see, uh, they, they see um, in the world to unseen spiritual forces, and they called them gods. This is called the God of the Gaps fallacy, okay? Whenever you have a dark corner in the universe that you don't understand, you just plug God and voila, you need God to explain the world. But then he says this, with progression of science, what happens in our knowledge? It increases, right? It becomes more complete. Um, Less gaps, less need for God. More science, yeah, just give it more time, we understand more about the world, the less we need God. So in previous days, we thought that thunder uh, and lightning happened because Zeus was angry, right? But now we know that there's no such a thing. So it's only electrical charges in clouds, colliding with each other, and producing an electrical current. Very scientific, naturalistic explanation with no need for a spiritual entity to explain anything. The hope here for Lawrence Krauss that someday this line would be a one complete solid line with no gaps and absolutely no need for God. Let me tell you this, from a certain perspective, I sympathize with this objection. What, what do I mean? I do not like it, not just me, but I mean uh, uh, philosophers of science who have Christian convictions. We do not like it, I, I, we, <laughs> I, I put myself amongst them, okay, anyway. I do not like it when people um, resort to faith out of ignorance, right? You know, um, we, we, we don't understand the world. It's so complicated. So therefore, it is a product of an intelligent being. But that, if you notice how the, you know, how the concept works, it's an argument out of ignorance, not, not out of knowledge. We're not like Kepler. Kepler, um, reach the conclusion that God is the creator of the world because he understood the mathematical equations behind the world, not because of his ignorance. But sometimes in our uh, zeal to defend the existence and the necessity of God, we basically try to uh, keep a, a, a mysterious sense about the world. Well, it's too complicated for us to understand. Therefore, God has done it. But that's not the best way. Okay, and Lawrence Krauss maybe helps us a little bit here to come up with a better argument, with a better conception of God. And I want to present that to you, and that's going to be my last uh, big idea, and we're going to take some questions. 
I want I want to help you make a distinction, a distinction that would give God his rightful place in like the ideas in the world of ideas, but also would give science its rightful place. And this distinction is between something called a mechanism and something that is called an agency. A mechanism and agency. These things are distinct. They are complementary, but they are distinct things. The mechanism seeks to answer the how question. How does a thing work? What is the mechanism by which this phenomenon occurs? But the agency is an, our attempt to answer the why question. Why is this mechanism there in the first place? So think of this. A, a huge part of the philosophy of science is how do we explain things? Okay, what is a good explanation? Okay, that's a huge area of study. All right? So the idea here, if someone asks you to explain to them a motor vehicle, a vehicle like a car, okay, or a motorcycle, you see? explain this to me. What is a motorcycle? Explain it to me. Well, you could go by the scientific route. You could just explain how internal combustion, now you have electrical cars that said to a completely different mechanism, but how internal combustion works, okay? How the fuel goes into the cylinders, how the cylinders, you know, ignite the fuel and, you know, how it changes the heat, the, the chemical energy into heat energy, into kinetic energy, and how it moves the car, all right? But also there's another type of expl explanation for the car. You could explain the car by positing Henry Ford. You know, Ford cars, are they named after Henry Ford? He is the inventor or, and the developer of the modern mo motor, okay? If you want a better, you know, the, there's like the Tesla battery and Elon Musk, okay? Let me ask you this. Do I need to choose between Elon Musk and the Tesla battery? Do I need to choose between Ford and the internal combustion mechanism? No. These are two parts of the answer. One is answering the how question. How does a car work? How does a car function? But also, there's another question. Why is there a car in the first place? Why is there a car that works through internal combustion? Well, because there is this guy, Henry Ford, he was so intelligent, he invented the car and told you to put gasoline in the tank, not Fanta, all right? Okay. Let me give you another illustration. Let's say I want to explain the boiling of the water inside here. I could go on the mechanistic, scientific route. I could explain to you that, you know, this is an electrical kettle. You know, there's a wire that has an electrical current, and then there's a coil. This coil heats, and because it uh, heats up, it uh, creates vibrations in the water molecules, and water molecules agitate and hit each other, and then they reach a boiling state, they evaporate, and because the lid is closed, there is a pressure uh, chamber here, and then it goes on and on until it boils. That's one explanation why or how the water is boiling. But there's another explanation. The water is boiling because, well, I need to drink some tea. These are not conflicting explanations. These are complementary explanations. One is trying to answer how is the water boiling, and another is trying to answer the question of why is the water boiling? Well, I put on the kettle because I need some tea. We do not need to choose. And when you think about the world that we live in, God has created it in such a way that we could discover its mechanism using science. He wants us to use science. He wants us to love science. I'm so passionate about science. I'm a doctor, by the way, by the, by, yeah, I'm a dentist. I was a dentist before I became full-time with Credologos here. We are, as Christians, invited to love science. Remember when we, when we were speaking in the Christian story last night, like 10 years ago, we, 
I said that humans were created to partner with God to rule the world. Well, one very important route in order to be able to actually fulfill this command is to understand the world and how it functions using science. God is the author of science and he wants us to love science and he wants us to understand how the world works and that's like Kepler said an act of worship an act of loving God by understanding his handiwork all right but also we need to understand that our understanding of the mechanism by which the world functions does not at all negate the need for an explanation of why the world is there. And let me just try to give you like a very concrete example. You probably heard of the Big Bang Theory. Raise your hand if you've heard about the Big Bang Theory, okay? Big Bang Theory is the dominant view today in cosmology about how the universe began 14, around 14 billion years ago. You know what? The Big Bang sometimes agitates a lot of Christians, okay? Because they feel, oh no. The Big Bang says that this world somehow came randomly and that we don't need God to create. No, no, no. Let's reject the Big Bang. Because you know what? The Big Bang is one of the best evidences that the world had a beginning and therefore needs an explanation of why it began. And we posit God as the creator and the beginner of the world using the Big Bang. You may reject the Big Bang and let's talk later about this. You're probably wrong, but Siani, uh, okay? But you don't need to choose between the Big Bang and God. The Big Bang is the mechanism and God is the agent that uses the mechanism to accomplish his purposes. Okay? Let me take this a little bit, a, a little bit more controversial, okay? Evolution. Now, we, now, Fan and Ba here, we can have a discussion. Is evolution true or la la? Uh, we don't know. There's good evidence for it, there's some problems with it, but it is still the dominant view. But again, even, you know, you know assume the worst happens, okay, and evolution is actually true, it's a mechanism, a mechanism that does not negate the need for an agent, an intelligent mind behind the mechanism that sets it up, but also determines its end and final purpose. You know, there's a huge difference between evolution, unguided, random evolution, versus guided, intentional evolution. You don't need to reject science to be a strong believer. Both can work together. Faith and science give us a bigger picture, a more complete picture. Go back to the idea of the book of scripture and the book of nature. If you believe in a God who created both, you will find harmony in the end. Yes, sometimes there's going to be conflict because we are limited humans. We, our understanding of scripture and our understanding of nature is still growing. And therefore, we still need some time to sort out and iron out the apparent, and I would highlight that, apparent contradictions. They're not real contradictions, just apparent. But if you, uh, understand that the idea that there is an agent that created the world through the Big Bang, well, things will be much easier. Let me let me just show you some slides. This guy's uh, Edwin Hubble. He you know he's the you know inventor of the Hubble telescope. He noticed some phenomena uh, in, in like in the in, in watching space that led him and other scientists to posit a beginning for the universe. By the way, before Edwin Hubble, like in the 1920s and 30s, cosmologists always thought that the universe was eternal, that it never had a beginning. It was always there. It, 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 they called it a steady state universe. It was there like this since, you know, forever. 
But these guys, these scientists discovered that no, actually the universe had a moment, they call the singularity, that was that marked the beginning of everything in the universe, space, time, matter, and energy. And throughout a few billion years, the universe expanded and expanded and evolved. And 14 billion years later, this is our solar system. And yes, here is Earth. So actually, if you go back in time, if you go back in time, the universe almost contracts, contracts like a, a, a balloon that is emptying its air until it reaches this beginning. And now you ask, why is there a universe in the first place? I understand how the universe came to exist and reached its current state, but you haven't answered the question of why is there a universe in the first place? Well, science cannot answer this question for you. Science can only stop at telling you the how, the mechanism, but you need other areas of input, like from philosophy, religion, to tell you why is there a universe in the first place? And you know, in this, very interestingly, when the Big Bang Theory first became like a, a strong candidate in the cosmology world, a lot of scientists rejected it. You know why? Because it had a very strong faith connotation. It sounds like in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And a lot of atheist scientists and philosophers thought that this Big Bang is basically a religious idea masquerading as a scientific theory. But with time, with very strong evidence, the Big Bang theory has proven, basically it has become a theory, not just a hypothesis. And that's why it is the dominant theory right now and it posits a beginning for the universe. And because there is a beginning, you need to ask about a cause, a beginner, uh, a reason for the beginning. And let me end by the quote from this atheist philosopher. Okay, He's writing at the time in which the Big Bang Theory has now just become the dominant theory. And he says this, for the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason. This guy is an atheist, okay? The story ends like a bad dream. He's speaking about scientists who now have now discovered, the, uh, established the Big Bang Theory, okay? He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He's about to conquer the highest peak, like to discover actually uh, how we became to exist, how, we, how we've come to exist. As he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. You understand the sarcasm here? He's being very sarcastic. He says, all these scientists have, are so proud they've you know, conquered ignorance and discovered the Big Bang and they really understood how the universe came about. It's like a big mountain that they're you know, pulling them, themselves up. And after they reach the top, they find a band of theologians who have been saying that the universe had a beginning since 3,000 years ago. Like the theologians, yeah, Mich Michel, I mean, the theologians themselves, since 3,000 years ago were saying that the universe had a beginning. We understand that, we know that. We know that there is a creator and he created the universe. We did not know how he created the universe, but now science has given us a good idea of the mechanism that he used, okay? You see, science and religion are not foes. They are friends. Sometimes they are portrayed as foes by people like Lawrence Krauss and Bill Nye, the science guy. You probably know him, and Richard Dawkins. But actually, if you go into the weeds and you study the history and you study the actual theories and you study the actual theology, you would find that actually they give us a complementing, a more rich view of our world and our universe. I'm done. I think this is the shortest lecture that you'll probably ever hear in this camp. Thank you. Do you believe that the argument for young Earth versus old Earth is like a serious question for the Christian faith, or do you think it doesn't matter? If so, can you explain your positioning on it? <laughs> Let me say this. 
It is an you know you understand her question so some some Christians say that the earth is young so they reject the big bang then they say that the earth is only 10,000 years old or like the whole universe is around somewhere between 6,000 and 10,000 years old and they calculate it by basically adding the genealogies in the book of Genesis other Christians say no we accept the big bang theory to explain the history of the universe for us in the bible to have a different and more episodic timeline and we shouldn't take that to to mean that it's like a, a full length explanation or display of the history of the universe and let me say this it is an important question because it shapes our theology in very central and uh, crucial ways um our view of god our view of humanity our view of sin our view of salvation our view of evil and suffering all of these ideas um did i say our view of humanity did i say that well that too all of these ideas very important ideas in our faith are affected by the position you adopt in the old earth young earth debate okay and i don't have time to go into the details but yani there's almost like a package of doctrines that is that you need to adopt if you adopt a young earth creation and another package of doctrines that you need to adopt if you uh, adopt a more um, uh, uh, let's say a long or an old earth uh, model so yes there it is an important question but i would say it is it is a dispute or a debate amongst uh, brothers and sisters in the faith yeah and i don't like the way sometimes young earthers um uh, accuse old earthers by being uh, soft in their faith and um like uh, giving in or giving way under the pressure of science and atheism in the university and culture actually Augustine who was one of the very early theologians in Christianity from the 5th century um thought that the early chapters of Genesis were metaphorical he actually thought you know how sometimes old earthers say god does not needs billions of years to create the world so you know probably heard that objection well he said he said something like this he said well god doesn't even need 7 days to create the universe god actually created the universe in a second okay but the story is given to us to display uh god as a worker who builds his house and rests on the seventh day exactly like he commanded uh us and and the people of israel to do that and augustine was writing in the 5th century 1400 years so 14 centuries before darwin even came on the scene okay so um not all old earth creationists uh, are somehow soft and uh, compromise in their faith i actually have a book uh, by a, a, a famous young earther uh, young earther it's called refuting compromise and he's you know um critiquing an old earth position but he calls them compromisers okay on the other hand old earthers a lot of times make fun and belittle young earthers that they are fundamentalists and radicals and behind the times um and you need to understand young earthers um have a difficulty in publishing their work in respected journals all right so they have their own books they have their own society and they're good scientists they all have phd's from good universities but they cannot go present their papers and their suggestions and alternative theories in respected journals so they're not taken seriously okay and that's a, and that's a difficult uh, thing because well their theology has very 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 strong theistic implications and that doesn't sit well in the academic world so there is a little bit of a conundrum here you might want to challenge the dominant theories but you're not able to even though you know that there are the dominant theories have some difficulties but also i want to say to the young earther you know what 
yes, sometimes there may be difficult in, difficulties in some scientific theories, but that doesn't mean they're absolutely wrong. So personally, you want my opinion. I, it depends on the day, okay, uh, and the weather. Sometimes I'm a young earther, sometimes I'm an older, sometimes I'm, uh, I'm what is called a, a theistic evolutionist or a, an evolutionary creationist. It really depends on who am I speaking to. I, um, I'm flexible in, in this area. If someone feels that, you know, all Christians are absolutely stupid because they all believe in a young earth that is absolutely against uh, all scientific consensus, to that person, I will become an absolute theistic evolutionist. No, the Big Bang is true, evolution is true, and God used these mechanisms to create his world. But if I'm speaking to a Muslim who somehow they have a, yeah, I mean, a similar view to a young earth uh, creation, I would adopt a young earther creation. I mean, it really depends on who I'm speaking to and why am I able to do this with a clear conscience? I'm not being a hypocrite here. I'm simply accepting the fact that good Faithful Christians who love the Bible and who are faithful to, its, to, to the word adopt different stances on this difficult question. And because, you know, I, I, I have heroes in every camp. Let me just say it that way. And because I'm able to um, see the strengths and weaknesses in every opinion, I'm a little bit in a position where I am on defense, not on... I'm not on defense, I'm on the fence, okay, when it comes to this question. And it really depends on the day, okay? Hi, okay, so I know I understand you talked about how like we should accept like the Big Bang Theory evolution that like- You don't understand or you do? I do understand. You do, okay, thank you. That like God is behind the mechanism and everything, but then like how do you explain it with God's timeline? Because you showed the picture and explained how it took like billions of years, but then like God created the earth in seven days. And then why would he say seven days if his timing is like different? And like, how would right. he align right. those? All right, okay, that's a good, okay, that's a follow-up question to I the, know, yeah. the previous question. So it depends on your position. How do you interpret the first few chapters of Genesis? Some interpreters, whether scientists or theologians or scholars of scripture, interpret these seven days as literal 24 hours seven days, okay, like a week, like a, a modern week. Other people see good reason, whether scientific, but also scriptural, to look at these days as metaphorical. So one, one idea is that, uh, you know, how does the sun appear after the plants? You know, the, the famous fourth, uh, third day dilemma, or second day dilemma, and um, some people say, well, there is good evidence for uh, allowing, uh, that allows us to reinterpret these ideas uh, or these notions in more of a metaphorical, uh, non-literal way. Are these people being unfaithful to scripture? I'm not sure why. Let's say we wind back the clock 500 years ago. Are you ready like to go time traveling? Okay, so 500 years ago, there was a huge controversy in the scientific community. Does the earth revolve around the sun or does the sun revolve around the earth? That was the hot topic 500 years ago. They had no idea about evolution. This was the hot topic at that time. The dominant view was a geocentric system. The earth is stationary and everything else goes around it. And you know what? Some theologians during that time found verses that said that the earth was stationary. Okay? That the earth is somehow uh, uh, put on uh, pillars. It doesn't move. That it is uh, solid. It is stable. And they understood these verses to uh, support a geocentric system. Geo from earth and centric system. Well, do you believe in a geocentric system? No, you don't. You absolutely don't, okay? You probably think that the earth moves around the sun, okay? So what do you do with these verses? Let's say that some, I, I could get them out now, but I don't have time. Uh, well, you would say that, well, these verses do not literally mean that the earth 
is stationary. It may, they may, may mean something about God's sovereignty and his ability to stabilize life or something like that. So you have shifted the way you understand these verses, but you still respect the Bible. Okay? And in that sense, a lot of old earthers today say, if we revise the way we read the first chapters of Genesis, that is not being unfaithful or compromising to the authority of the Bible. We're just understanding it in a better way uh, because of the discussion that is going on in the world. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, so it's a matter of interpreting the relevant passages, not about who loves the Bible more, uh, who is faithful to God's scripture more. Okay? Other question? Yes, go ahead. So where does that put Adam and Eve in the whole evolution timeline? Okay. Again, it depends on the like opinion you adopt. M most young earthers and a lot of old earthers um, um, adopt what is called a historical Adam position. Adam and Eve were historical individuals, they might place them differently along the line. So, for example, you might, you might hear of William Lane Craig, okay, very, very, very famous Christian thinker and apologist and philosopher, and he recently wrote a book about the historical Adam, and he believes in an evolutionary timeline, and he places Adam around 750,000 years ago. Okay, as the uh, primary human couple, Adam and Eve, and he um, includes Neanderthals under the, under the um, you know, human race. And uh, a, another closely related uh, group called the Denisovans. Anyway, so he believes in a historical Adam and Eve and a historical fall, but he places them a little bit backwards in the timeline. Young earthers would, not, would say, no, there's an Adam and Eve, but they were maybe 6,000, 7,000 years ago. Um, that's the timeline. Other Christians would say that Adam and Eve are uh, literary devices. Okay, what, what does that term mean? It just means that uh, the Bible um, expresses spiritual truths in a literary story. So they look here at Adam and Eve, not as, as historical individuals who lived somewhere in the history line, but Adam and Eve as uh, a, um, basically a story that represents all of humans, but they do not necessarily have existed somewhere in the timeline. Personally, I would want to adopt a view that preserves the historicity of Adam and Eve, regardless of where it puts them along the timeline. I feel that, um, I mean, um, uh, sacrificing the historicity, historicity of Adam and Eve has very radical um, ramifications to your theology that I'm not ready to, uh, to accept. Uh, so I want to uh, accept the historicity of Adam and Eve, but I may be on the fence on where on the timeline do I put them. Okay? It's a very um, delicate distinction. Um, the question was, you talked a lot about these, the scientific mechanisms um, that were created by God. So then that, one of the questions that that begs is then how much does God intervene now? He created all these mechanisms like the Big Bang, maybe evolution, all of these things. But to what extent does God intervene or, or mess with the stuff now? Great question. Look, some Christian thinkers, um, okay, Christian thinkers perceive greatness the greatness of God in different terms, okay? So for some, for some Christian thinkers, they feel that a God who sets everything up in the beginning, and he's so good, he's so clever, he's such a, a, an ultra super genius that puts everything in motion and then steps back and lets it outwork itself on its own, that's a sign of greatness and glory, okay? So the more hands off, God is, for these thinkers, the, the, the more glorified he would become. For them, a God who continuously or regularly intervenes 
It's like a, a very um, a mediocre engineer who needs to go and fix things every once in a while. Okay, that's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it, that what makes God great is not his intelligence and power to create a system, but his closeness and nearness to his creation. That's what makes God great. And for these people, the regular intervention of God is actually a sign of his uh, intimacy with the universe and intimacy with humans. So a lot of these thinkers love the idea of gradual creation. Seven days, seven uh, stages uh, at, you know, millions of years apart where God, you know, creates something, he leaves it to outwork itself, whether to evolve or do its thing, and then he comes again. And, uh, and then God said, and then he leaves things to uh, grow and develop on its own. And then God said, like it's more like a, a progressive creation uh, process. So it really depends on, uh, philosophers call it a uh, great making feature. What's the feature, the great making feature that is more important to you? Do you appreciate a God who is so clever that he likes plants the seed and leaves it? Well, do you appreciate a God who intervenes regularly, okay? Taban, someone would ask, it doesn't matter what I like, you know, what the great making feature would you like to have today? You know, it's like, it doesn't matter what great, it, what matters is what scripture is saying. And here's where the difficulty lies. Scripture in this area is somewhat open to different interpretations and different ideas. And again, People who love God, who love the Bible, who are faithful to scripture, have different opinions about how to interpret that, okay? So, um, some people uh, see scripture as describing a more hands-off God. Some people see scripture as describing a more hands-on God. But by the way, both, both people, both the theologians or thinkers would be open to the idea of miracle. So miracles are um, purposeful interventions that are not according to re regular laws of nature that are, are intended to accomplish a very specific purpose of God, uh, for God in a certain time. Uh, and even evolutionary creationists who are very generally hands off when it comes to God's intervention in creation are still very open to the idea of God intervening here and there for miraculous acts, okay? Some of them even say that the rise of consciousness in humanity is a miraculous act. We cannot explain it by evolution alone. This, is, this needs a, a, a miraculous intervention. So again, it really depends on who you're speaking to, what kind of philosopher or theologi uh, theologian or biblical scholar you're speaking to, but there's a very ongoing and alive debate in between Christians today. Okay, I have a question. What does science have to say about sin? What is? What does? Like, what does science have to say about sin? Like, S about how sin. does it like intertwine together? Or does science have nothing to do with sin? Okay, it's a good question. What does science say have to about, uh, about sin? What, which science? Um, like, I guess. And I'm not really sure, but just... Yeah, yeah, I understand. I'm yeah. asking you, I'm asking you because there is no simple answer for your question. Mm -hmm. Yanni, what branch of science is concerned with sin? What is the definition of sin? Uh, are sins, are, are we speaking about sin as in moral blunders, you know, lying, uh, um, or are we speaking about the brokenness of the world and things like that? Mm. I, I'm, I'm asking rhetorically. I don't. I don't want. I didn't answer. It. That's fine. It, it, but you can. You can. You can come back I, if you want to. So, I was thinking of how does like. Okay, so I know that something is wrong. Okay, but why do I still choose to do it? Okay, or 
what makes me want to do the sin? You know, like, is there a science behind that? Or... Okay, okay, I understand your question now. Look, I want to, I want to teach you a word, okay? It's a bad word. I don't want, yeah, I mean, it's not a bad word, but I mean, it's a, it's a word that I want you to reject. This word is called reductionism. You know, reductionism comes from reducing, okay? Reductionism is a way of thinking that takes a very complex phenomena, a multifaceted phenomena, and reduces it to only one of its aspects. That's a very bad way of thinking about things, okay? It's a simplistic way. It attempts to explain things but by making them more simple, but by making them more simple, it misses out on the complexity of the thing you're trying to explain. So let me try to explain what I'm saying, okay? Without reducing it. The concept of sin, the brokenness of humankind, our biology, our relationality, our ideas, our addictions, our leanings, our weaknesses, it's a very complicated and multifaceted uh, um, uh, reality of who we are. It contains a physical, biological element that pertains to our hormones, our neurons, our genetics, but also there is a moral, societal uh, uh, um, um, aspect of the, the kinds of relationships we, are, we found ourselves in, our uh, psychology, how we were brought up, but also there is a spiritual aspect where is our minds and souls and spirit and how they interact with the forces in the world, whether it be, whether it be material or spiritual. So what I'm trying to say, I cannot reduce sin into one of these aspects. Let's say I'm speaking about a specific sin, okay? Um, a, a pornography addiction, for example. I cannot reduce pornography addiction just to dopamine and oxytocin and some neuronal connections. Yes, this is a very important part of a pornography addiction, but it's not, that, it's not the only part. I also cannot reduce um, porn a pornography addiction to your childhood and how were you raised and you know whether you had a, a good childhood and loving parents, whether you were exposed uh, to pornography as a child. I'm, I'm not speaking about you, I'm just speaking generally. I also cannot spe uh, reduce pornography addiction just uh, to a spiritual struggle, you know, just pray it away. You know, uh, pray and God will save you from your addiction. No, there is a very physical, medical aspect of pornography addiction. Okay, so I want to say you cannot reduce sin to only one part uh, of the ex uh, elements that explain it. There is a moral, spiritual, scientific, physical, societal, psychological aspect. And as a Christian, I want to take all of these into consideration when I um, look at sin, whether be it on a, like a global a global general uh, scale or on a personal struggle, you know, very, very real and intimate scale, okay? Um, so I wanna, if I meet someone who has a pornography addiction, I would pray with them and encourage them to pray, but I would give them a book about breaking bad habits. I would wanna send them to some counseling to figure out, you know, the effects on their psychology. I would help them and give them some accountability, uh, um, a community that they could be part of. I would s help them set up some filters and blockers on their phones and devices so it breaks their neuro neurological connections that, you know, basically makes them more prone to watching pornography. It's a whole a package. And actually, that's a, that's a thing, if I want to connect that, both of my lectures, that's a nice thing about the Christian story. The Christian story is comprehensive in its view of the world. It's not reductionistic. Atheism is reductionistic. Very, very much, much so. 
But Christianity wants to put into consideration all of the aspects. I hope, I hope I've, I've answered your question. I think this may be, have an important point. Yes, Fadali. I agree with you I, that um, God can be the agent of different scientific mechanisms. Yeah. But can you maybe expand a little bit more on how God can be the agent of evolution? Like as a Christian, um, how can I believe that God is the agent of evolution, but still believe in the biblical description of man and woman in Genesis 2? Okay, so complicated question. Look, it depends on whether evolution is random and unguided or not. The, the, the difficulty with studying evolution, I'm, I'm not defending it, by the way. I have my, my reservations on the theory, and I'm not completely sold on it. So just, I'm just trying to explain it to you as someone who would defend it would say. Um, the difficulty in studying evolution is that we do not see the whole process. We see very, very, very small and minute evidences of microevolution, let's say the evolution of bacteria or the variety between, you know, uh, very closely associated species, and we extrapolate that into a whole tree of very, very distant and macro uh, um, um, evolutionary strands and branches, okay? And from our perspective, or like from a scientific perspective, Evolution seems completely random, completely uh, um, according to basically the environment. Whatever the environment dictates, it selects for certain traits, okay? And that's why atheistic scientists will always want to say that evolution is completely random and unguided. But let me just tell you this. We, can, we cannot know for sure whether evolution is guided or unguided by studying evolution. Why? In order to know whether a thing is guided or unguided, you actually need to figure out the question whether it has a final end in mind or a final direction that it wants to go to. And we don't have access to that final direction. We do not see the whole timeline. So Christian philosophers and scientists that accept evolution say that evolution by its own virtue as a scientific theory, cannot tell us whether it's guided or not. So as a philosophical assumption, we have to say that God has set up evolution in motion in order to reach this, this state that we're in. L let, me, let me explain it a little bit better. If you take evolution as a merely random process and statistically try to calculate the time needed for a single-celled organism to reach the complexity of life that we have today, you need hundreds and billion, hundreds of billions of times more of the actual age of the universe, okay? You basically don't have enough time for the possibilities to be um, tried in order to actually reach the complexity that we have today. You need a much, much older universe than 14 uh, billion year, years old. And that's why Christian philosophers who like the theory of evolution say that it seems that somehow the, as it were, the cards are stacked. You know how to stack the deck? You know when you stack a deck, it, you, you design something that seems random, but it actually has an intention behind it. The, the deck is stacked in favor of humanity or like, the current uh, biological complexity that we have now. And without that uh, rigging of the game of evolution, which is only done by an intelligent mind, you will not have the kind of complexity that we have now in that kind of short period. So this is a complicated answer that just say says that there are good reasons to think that a merely random, unguided evolution will go nowhere. Uh, and in order for evolution to work in the way we assume it to work in the 14 billion years that we've had, or like 4 billion years because the Earth is only 4 billion years old, um, you need actually some uh, uh, inherent preparation. 
that is only uh, able, be, able to be done by an intelligent creator. Am I clear? You have a follow-up? It's okay. You, you, can, you can follow up. Yes, go ahead. So you said that the first couple of chapters in Genesis can be taken figuratively. So I'm wondering like, what else in the Bible can be taken figuratively if we're gonna stick to that? That's a very good question. One of the biggest difficulties for the group of scholars and theologians that say that Genesis could be taken figuratively is this. Where is the dividing line between figurative and historical? Yani, if Adam is figurative, is Noah also figurative? Is Abraham also, is Jesus also figurative? Where is the dividing line? Okay, they would answer, they would answer, well, um, the Bible is not just one book with one genre, with one style of writing. The Bible is a library of books that has many genres of writing. So there is a poetic style, there is a literary style, but also there is a historical style. So they would say, for example, that the Gospel of Luke is very obviously and clearly written as a historical genre, okay? Uh, chronicling the biography of Jesus. So it's not in any way meant to be taken figuratively, even though it contains figurative elements. For example, the prodigal sons, okay? That's a story told by Jesus, recorded by Luke, which is a, who is a historian, yet it is meant to be taken figuratively because there was no uh, two prodigal sons. It's a story. So they want to say that as scholars and even as normal readers, you could easily, most of the time, figure out whether the text you're reading is historical or figurative. The difficulty that they say, the difficulty with Genesis is that it is not very, especially the first 11 chapters. So from Adam going through Noah, going up to the Tower of Babylon. Okay, that's the debatable area. It's not very clear what is historical and what is figurative or metaphorical. There is a back and forth in that. Most of these scholars would say that starting Genesis 12, so Abraham, now that is historical, okay? And, but that is a difficult point because it seems like an arbitrary, you know, what's an arbit you know what arbitrary means? Like there doesn't seem to be logical criteria by which you say, yes, this is figurative, this is, historical, okay? And, and, and it is a big difficulty. And that's why, that's why as a, uh, personally, I would always lean towards having, I would call them non-negotiables, okay? Let me, let me be a little bit clearer, clearer. I wanna guide you, I don't wanna confuse you guys. I know it's a big topic and it's very debatable and hot and some people just take it very, uh, you know, to their heart. I can, accept that the tree of knowledge of good and evil is a figurative literary uh, tool in the story. You know, if there was no tree, I wouldn't lose my faith or lose even some sleep over it. But I cannot negotiate in the historical Adam and the historical Eve and the definite intentional decision to break the covenant with God, the one we spoke about in the Christian story last night. But they could have done it with, you know, like cutting up a piece of paper or eating a fruit or jumping over a hoop. I don't know. Okay. They've, they've done something. Okay. That is, was indicative of their intentional decision to break away from God. But whether it be eating from a fruit or doing something else, I'm okay with being flexible here. All right. So I want to preserve a historical Adam and Eve. I want to preserve a historical fall, uh, an event of some kind that was um, uh, yeah, very determinative of our nature today as humans and very um, catastrophic to the kinds of, even I would, I would say change the laws of nature that we live by, uh, that we live in. Yet I do not know uh, how it happened or even where it happened. Yani, 
if for some reason, Masalan, we discovered that the first humans were in Africa, not in uh, the ancient Near East, okay? I would, be, I would be fine with that, as long as there is a historical couple with a historical fall, okay? Difficult, very, very difficult. And by the way, this is an area of strength for the young earth um, opinion. They do not, uh, everything is literal, خلاص. it's over. I do not uh, try, ah, this is historical, ah, this is figurative, ah, this is, uh, no, no. Everything is as is apparent in the text. And that's why their theological position is very solid, very coherent. They don't have a lot of um, theological gymnastics, basically. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Perfect. Um, so in, as a Christian, or Christianity claims that God is all-powerful, all-knowing. And today you talked about how there's this perfect mechanism that was created at the beginning, that speed of light is still the same from day one, gravity is still the same from day one. How come God was able to create such a perfect and balanced universe, yet it came to humans and it did not go as planned? Uh, sorry, say again, uh, last sentence. How come God was able to create such a balanced and perfect universe with the mechanism still working at well, and even the scientists are able to prove it to this day, uh, but it came to humans and it did not go as planned. We as humans are not doing what God intended from yeah. day one. Okay, so the main difference between human agents and all of nature is conscious free will. Uh, remember when I was saying that Newton was uh, critiquing uh, ancient Greek science that it uh, somehow said that nature has a soul inside of it, but Christians do not think so. Christians think that uh, nature is inanimate. It's a creation of God. God created it out of nothing. So it has no ability to disobey or reject God or... It's just nature, okay? But humans are different, are distinct from nature. They have the ability to reject God. And God created them with that ability. He didn't want slaves. He didn't want robots. He wanted lovers, sons, partners, as we've said yesterday. So uh, the ability, the, the, the unfortunate fact that humans do not go according to God's plan in a way, is God's plan. Not that he wanted us to stray away, but he wanted us to be free, whether to stay or leave. And in that way, that is his plan. Okay? So uh, us being able to use our free will on our own accord, whether for ill or good, is God's plan. And uh, I'm okay with that. All right? Thank you so much. Lord Jesus, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for giving us the intellectual capacities to even be able to discuss such things. God, thank you for giving us minds and brains to be able to um, even conceive of some of these things. God, thank you that, um, that you created a big, beautiful world um, for us to explore and ask questions and have discussions. Um, God, that this is all part of it, that, that these types of conversations are all part of the big, beautiful thing that you made. And so, God, I pray that as a result of these conversations, um, that, that deeper thinking, um, that deeper love and honor for you, that um, better skills in conversations and, and analyzing texts and looking at scientific data, that all of these things would be things that provoke us to growing into being more whole, mature human beings. So God, thank you so much um, for what you have brought to us. Thank you for the questions. And I pray that in the ensuing conversations um, and time that you would be honored. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.